Hi everyone, we're John and Carol Arnott, and we're the founders of Catch the Fire Ministries we are. And, and Partners in Harvest yeah. and all that God has done in this amazing place. But we're here now celebrating the surge, which originally we wanted to have a big we spring did. conference oh, yeah. where everybody we came and we laid hands, hands on, on you, you and it was all a good time. Uh, but God had other plans, didn't he? And so now we're doing this on a global uh, webinar platform and we're excited about all that he's going to bring to all of us as we go through this day together, celebrating who Jesus is and all that he is about to do. Over the next two hours, you're going to experience many testimonies and we're going to share many things about what God has done and is going to do over the next years globally around the world. And it's going to be so exciting for the impartation and the anointing to come through you and you can participate in this with us.
favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children you follow to me
success without a successor is no success at all. We give our lives to succession because we give our lives to raising up spiritual sons and daughters. A righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. The way that impacts me now is I realize that righteousness has an effect on a person. How they see the shortness of our own lifetime and how vital it is for us to live for a generation we may never see. That we actually create a momentum that they will inherit and take it where we couldn't go. What a privilege. He takes us from glory to glory. You know, one of the problems that we've had in our study of revival through the years is we base all of our conclusions on what has happened instead of on the heart and nature of God. In other words, every move of God has ended, so therefore people assume it must have been the will of God. And that's just not quite accurate. The scripture says, God lights the fire on the altar. It's the priests that keep it burning. And I believe that we are positioned, you guys are positioning yourselves well with a very strong, broad leadership there in Toronto, in Catch the Fire World, to really ensure that we keep, keep a fire burning. We keep putting ourselves on that altar for the fire of God to arrest our hearts and to move in us and through us. And you have that kind of a, uh, that kind of a setup, if you will, that kind of a, uh, a, a reality created already for you to carry that to the next level. So I'm just glad, I'm thankful for you guys and thankful for what you're doing. Succession planning is, uh, you know, it's a great idea. And uh, a lot of people think about it, talk about it, and uh, try to emulate it, but it usually, oftentimes, I should say, crashes and burns. You guys are doing it well. You're doing it well because it's real spiritual mothers and fathers raising up real spiritual sons and daughters. You've done it, you've done it well. And I'm thankful for what is about to be released in and through this couple, but the whole team. You've got such a team put in place uh, for, this, for this time. There is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but now it's revealed, unfolded and manifested for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with every expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within in us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope with the riches of glory for his people and God wants everyone to know it. Christ is our message. Christ is the message of John and Carol. Christ is the message of Kate and Duncan. Christ is Roland and my message. We are lovers of Christ Jesus and we're gonna live in his embrace. Together we are gonna see the world just turning, turning, turning closer and closer. They're turning towards the face of Christ. They're stepping into the Father's love and they're going to move in a new dimension of his peace. Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth. Hallelujah.
I had just gone through a, a divorce and it was a bit of a messy divorce. Um, there was a lot of emotional abuse from my ex-husband. Kind of put the boys to bed early and, and uh, went up and brushed my teeth. I was going to go to bed early. And um, all of a sudden I heard a voice, an audible voice in my bathroom. And I thought, oh my gosh, is it my ex-husband? Has he broken into the house again? And I, I, I ran through the house and into the garage, searched everything. All the doors were locked. Everything was okay. And I thought, that's really strange. But I went back upstairs and I picked up the toothbrush, started rebrushing my teeth. The voice stopped or started again. And it stopped and started like five times. And I thought, oh my gosh. I'm hearing voices now. I must be having a nervous breakdown. But then I thought, no, those voices were audible. What? A so I threw my toothbrush in the sink and I just kind of stood there frozen. I thought, all right, I'll listen. And I just stood there and the voice started again, but this time repeated, said the 23rd Psalm. And about Oh, three quarters of the way through, I knew that it was Jesus, and I knew he loved me in all the sin and all the pain that I was in. And I thought, oh, this incredible joy bubbled up in my heart. And I thought, a Bible, I, I know I have a Bible, and I found my confirmation Bible, the white one with the zipper around. It was in my bottom dresser drawer, and I got it out, and I... I knew it was a 23rd Psalm, so I got it out and I read this 23rd Psalm again and again and again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. It just went on and the more I read it, the more it just bubbled up and there was such joy in my heart. Two weeks after I heard the audible voice of Jesus in the in my bathroom and he repeated the 23rd Psalm and I got born again, although I didn't have that terminology. Um, a friend of mine had been asking for three years prior to have me go to Catherine Kuhlman's meeting. Now, she was a woman evangelist, healing evangelist, very p wonderful and powerful. And all the other years, I just kind of, ugh, I don't want to. If I want to go to church, I can go to church at my own church. Why do I need to go to London? Anyway, this year, she praised God for her persistence and love. She asked me again, and it was about two weeks after I heard Jesus in the bathroom. And I said, yes, and she was stunned. And she says, you really want to go? I said, yeah, I do. Because, you see, I hadn't told her what had happened because I thought she'd think I was crazy because I didn't have words for it. I just knew Jesus loved me. And so we went into the choir uh, at Catherine, so we didn't have to line up. So we had to sing in the choir. And during that meeting, the Holy Spirit's presence was so there. And I didn't really know the Holy Spirit. But in hindsight, I recognized that why it was, I was so touched. I was crying and I had no reason to cry. It was just this presence would come. Anyway, we started to sing this one song, and then Catherine spent the next 40 minutes talking about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And that just impacted my life because she said at one point, the Holy Spirit is more real to me than any human being. And I went, what? What is she talking about? I mean, I hardly even know who the Holy Spirit is because in church it was God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. And as a kid, I knew what a ghost was, but they never explained. So I didn't know that the Holy Spirit was a person and that you could get to know him. And then she just... She just went on about, it. you could tell it was real, and her love for him was just so wonderful. And then she 
you know, continued on with the miracle service afterwards that we saw a little boy with club feet with the plaster casts and whatever, take those plaster casts off and run across the stage. It was just incredible miracles that Jesus accomplished that night. And, and then she gave a, an altar call, as she would call it, for salvation to accept Jesus into your heart. And then I realized that what really happened to me in the bathroom there was that I was really actually born again. And that if I would have died before I even went to Catherine's, I would have gone to heaven because Jesus went from my head to my heart, that long distance, 18 inches of incredible change. I had a powerful encounter with God when I first went to Israel in 1974 through the ministry of David Duplessis. He talked about the love of God and somehow just where I was at in my walk with the Lord at that time, I just got busted publicly. I mean, I lost it. And I'm weeping and sobbing, and I just cannot get it together because I was so undone with his message of the Father's love. And uh, I had gone to Israel just hungering for reality, and I'm like, wow, this is such a big deal for me, going to Israel, the promised land, for the very mm -hmm. first time, you know. And, and so I went on a three-week water fast, and I wanted to be ready to meet with God. And uh, wow, he he got me all right. <laughs> I was just undone. And at night, after a long day of touring and conference and so on, um, I could not sleep because these waves of heaven would just start rolling over me night after night after night. I think I only got about five or six hours sleep for the whole week we were there. But the love of God was so intense. And I can remember saying, Lord, if one more wave comes on me like this, I'm not going to yeah. live through it. Yeah. So we're at 30,000 feet just weeping, saying, God, we can't give our lives to business. We have to go into the ministry. Just mm. open doors and, and we'll do anything for you. And the Lord said to me, good, I want you to go to Carol's hometown, <laughs> Stratford, Ontario, yeah. and begin a charismatic church there. Because there wasn't one, really. No. They had evangelical churches, they had a Pentecostal church, but no charismatic church. Mm -hmm. And so we said, okay. And we went and started. The Lord began blessing yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And and it was it was amazing <laughs> to me. I can remember telling my mother, Mom, we had seven young people yeah. saved again last week. And she'd be like, wow, that's, that's phenomenal. That's amazing. And we didn't really know what we were doing. We just kept talking about Jesus. And, and, but because of that encounter with the love of God, uh, we were wanting a love church. And we mm -hmm. told them that, that yeah. God loves you. He loves you just the way you are, so come as you are. But he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So you're going to go from glory to glory to glory as he builds in you that inward journey and then takes you on the upward journey and the outward journey. And so we started our church in Stratford, and we began learning about uh, the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, yeah. and uh, and then how to hear His voice, and so that's what we did. And all these young people that Carol and I had gathered around us, we we taught them everything we knew. And <laughs> as we pressed in on the Lord, He began falling upon us supernaturally at a whole mm. new level. Yeah. Now, as Carol had shared, we were very familiar with the ministry of Catherine Kuhlman, the ministry of Benny Hinn, uh, and, and uh, several ministries that ministered in power like that 
But it wasn't something we were used to. No. And as we pressed in on that, yeah. uh, God began to move. And I tell you, it got to be quite intense. <laughs> and some of it was, I was afraid that it was so out of order. It was getting weird. And it scared us a little bit. And I got to the point where I said, right. I don't want any of you guys now praying for each other from now on. Carol and I will do all the ministry. I made a mistake and shut it all down, saying from now on we'll do all the praying. Yeah. But it took about two weeks where the Holy Spirit just gradually stopped coming until everything stopped. And we're like, oh, goodness, what has happened? What have we done? So... I said, Lord, I've made a terrible mistake here. Please forgive me. And if ever you give us another opportunity mm -hmm. here, we want the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. So, fast track. Mm -hmm. We started our Toronto church, and uh, Carol and I did both churches for five years. And then somewhere around the summer of 92, we moved to focus on Toronto. And we, we had conferences, we had Sunday meetings and all of that sort of thing. But we went to Argentina because we heard revival yeah. was going on there that was shaking the nation. But I also had heard about Claudio Friesen and we went to his meeting and he graciously agreed to pray for all the foreigners. And so it's our turn. Up we go. Carol gets prayer. Boom. She's completely, um, totally undone, wasted. She can't walk. She can't talk. She's laughing and all this stuff. And I felt like I got touched and fell down politely. And so I back up on my knees sort of in this posture, thinking, God, we're just so hungry for you. And Claudio turned to me and he said, do you want it? And I said to him, yes, I want it. And I'm thinking, why do you think we've <laughs> flown thousands Some of miles, miles and spent thousands of dollars? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we want it. He said, then take it. And those were transforming words for me because I'd never considered that the Holy Spirit was there for the taking. Mm -hmm. It was more like, well, you wait passively, and when he's ready, he'll fall on you, and that'll, that'll be it. But no, I realized at that moment that it was like a divine romance where, where two people need to move closer together because they both want each other. And so the Lord was wanting a relationship with me, but I had to reach back to him. Carol and I came home from Argentina knowing something was different. And we saw the evidence of it. We saw it on the airplane. People were led to Jesus on the airplane. Carol led two people to Jesus on the flight home. And we met some friends just before we got back home who told us about another friend named Randy Clark who had been similarly impacted to what we were telling uh, in a Rodney Howard Brown meeting. And so I called Randy and I said, Randy, I need you to come. So this is the end of November of 93. He said, the soonest I could come would be January in 1994. Mm -hmm. Well, as we had various meetings, New Year's Eve and so on, the Holy Spirit is once again moving, and he's falling on people, and people are falling over and on the floor and everything, and we're, we're almost afraid to hope for it again, you know? We didn't have faith to just say, this is it, let's go. Nor did Randy. He came in fear and trembling. Yeah. He's like, gosh, John, uh, it only happened once, and I don't know if anything's going to happen. And we're like, well, come on, and we'll just see what God does. And um, he came, and uh, wow, I remember that night so well. We were in our, our former church, Derry and Dixie Road, and there's maybe 130 people in the room that night. 
And Randy told his testimony about how God had brought him out from uh, depression and this and that. It was hard being a church planter. And uh, he told the story that the, the presence and the touch of God mm -hmm. had brought him through. And he said, if anyone would like me to pray for you, then come on up to the front and I'll be happy to lay hands upon you and pray for you. And so people hesitated for a moment, you know, and then they said, you know what, I think I'm going to go. And as people went to get up out of their chairs and come forward, that's when it happened. The Holy Spirit, boom, fell on us. And all of a sudden, the whole room is all over the floor. Mm -hmm. They're laughing, they're shrieking, they're yelling, they're weeping. I mean, and people are under the chairs. They're in the aisle, they're between the rows and this huge uproar going on in the room. And I'm like, God, what just happened? I'd never seen anything like that in all my life. It was gloriously chaotic, loud, full of joy, full of passion and expression. And yet we knew it was God. We just didn't know why he would do it like this because it seemed so disordered orderly to what we were used to. But anyway, that was our beginning. And we went the next night and more people started to come. We went the next night. So Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, January 20, 21, uh, 22. And by that Saturday meeting, We've got one more day planned. I said, Randy, you cannot go home. We have to call your wife and just appeal to her, please, Randy, can't go home, Deanne, because God's moving. And she says, all right, he can stay two more days. And we're like, great, we're gonna go two more days, everybody. And then we called her back, said, He's, he can't go home yet, Deanne. All right, two more days, but that's it, she says. So we're like, great. Well. The word got out that God's moving at the church yeah. and the testimonies are coming in. My marriage was healed. My body was healed. My headaches are gone. My, my shame is gone. My pain is gone. And uh, people started getting healed of, of various things, mental issues, emotional issues, physical issues. And we knew that this was the move of God that we had been dreaming about, praying about, and now it was full on. Well, Randy went home uh, that Friday, yeah. and now it's over to us, I know. right? Yeah. And I don't like, know what you were thinking. I'm like, <laughs> oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, God. oh, God. <laughs> now yeah. what? And the big fear was, what happens if we get up there and welcome everybody and, and the whole thing, happens. but the Holy Spirit doesn't show up. And that was, that was a big fear. That we, was. We, you know, because you struggle with your own inadequacies, your own unworthiness. And we just were not in touch with the anointing that was upon our own no. lives. But you know something? When we went ahead mm -hmm. that first Friday night when we're on our own, the Holy Spirit came just like he had been coming all that time. January 25, 1994, was an invitation from John who had phoned me that morning. That was a Monday morning. And the reason I went would have been twofold. The first was what John said. He said that they were carrying people out of the meetings. And that provoked me because that's not the tradition that we came from. We came from conservative evangelical Baptist church. One of the reasons that I said yes to John in that phone call was because I was shriveling up on the inside, uh, just not doing well as a Christian, not doing well as a father, not doing well as a husband. And something in my spirit, without knowing that I had a spirit functioning in those days, but something in my spirit said, I need to say yes, I need to go to that meeting. And so that's why we went. Our very first meeting on Monday, January 25, we got there a little early, it's before crowds are coming, uh, and we sat in the back row, mm -hmm. good Baptists, close to the door, and I was freaking out before the meeting began, 
people were manifesting, people were laughing, crying, shaking. And I thought John Arnott has gathered the most dysfunctional, neurotic, uh, messed up people. And God bless John for loving these people that needed help. It was so distracting. The worship was wonderful, but I couldn't focus on the worship. The testimonies were bizarre of people who can't finish their stories. They're laughing, they're, they're crying, they're falling on the ground. Everyone in the, in the, the church is laughing at people trying to tell their stories. It was so disruptive to everything that I had grown up with. Mm -hmm. And yet we stayed for the meeting and we stayed for the ministry time. Stephen said, hey, let's go. And I'm like, okay, well, what do I have to lose? You know, like a lot of things had fallen apart in our lives and we just didn't know where we were going. But in hindsight, I realized I went because the door was opening and that we had an opportunity and that once we went through that door, um, there was no going back. I think that when when um, I walked in the room, I just saw so much going on. You have to remember that traditionally, I was brought up in that you you sat in a pew and um, you were very quiet. Nobody made nobody made noises. Nobody laughed. Nobody did anything. And so here I my well here I am, I'm walking into a room, and people are laughing. People are crying. Um, people are interrupting each other. I remember thinking when John Arnott was interviewing people on the stage and people would start laughing and I thought, how rude, you know, why would they do that? You know, the Holy Spirit did a lot of deliverance in, in me. There was a lot of pain from the past, a lot of confusion that, that was inside of me and it had nowhere to go. And so I remember, um, um, Jack Frost used to sh show this picture of a man um, in, as an illustration where the pain would come and it would just go down and something would happen and you would just shove the pain down more and more. And that's what happened with me. I had so much pain and so much stuff inside of my heart. Um, finally, it had nowhere to go. And I remember there was one particular meeting that that we had gone to where um, we were actually at that time being um, asked to leave the vineyard and we had to tell our, sm our small group leaders. And at that time, all of a sudden inside of me, it was like a volcano. All of a sudden, I just began to yell and I had no idea. I don't think I'd ever yelled like that in my life, but it was pain that, that had, had come out of me. And then as it was coming out of me, there were people surrounded that who had surrounded me and the Holy Spirit just came and just poured into me. And it was like the love of the Father came and replaced all that pain with his love. And it was the safest place I could have been. The Holy Spirit did two big things in me in the first few months. And the first was a character change in my life, dealing with my anger, dealing with my criticism, dealing with my perfectionism dealing with a very critical spirit towards Sandra and my, and my kids. So that inner transformation qu uh, quickly began to happen. That inner transformation quickly began to happen. And then the second thing was that I began to realize that God was using me. I had always wanted, as a little kid, to be able to do signs and wonders and to do miracles, and they had never happened before. And now I realized that God's anointing was on my hand and that when I was given the opportunity to pray for people, first of all, that there would be, they'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, which was an amazing thing to realize when you touch your, uh, somebody, put your hand on them, that the Spirit of God came when you said, come Holy Spirit. That was a shock that God would use me. And then people began to be healed when I started to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And I realized that God had given me an, an anointing for healing the sick. So I embraced that. I love that. God is using me. Um, and I remember we were sitting up in bed late one night reading the Assemblies of God official magazine, Redemption Tidings, and there was a little report in there about something happening uh, in a little church in Toronto. Right at that moment when we were reading that, the phone rang and it was Benny and Suzanne, and um, he, he said, there's something happening in Toronto with my friend Johnny Arnott. Um, they'd been friends, hadn't they, yeah. years ago? Because Benny came from Toronto. 
because we're talking about Benny Hill, <laughs> came from Toronto. And he said, I think you should go and, and see about this. So actually, uh, Ken had been to Holy Trinity Brompton in the meantime. And we, and we actually, I was, our church took up an offering and, and sent us to Toronto. So we arrived there. We did. <laughs> we did. We arrived there and we, we took with us our youth leader. And um, we stayed in the White Knight. The White Knight Hotel, yeah. and um, you know, we we're able to rent a car, and uh, we would go to this um, quite a small building, and totally amazed at the lines and lines of people waiting to get in. Mm. But um, we got in, and um, it wasn't long after being actually in the building, settled the down, and night. sitting down on the first night, that I received a tap on my shoulder from one of the ushers and um, he said are you Ken Gott you Ken and Lois Gott we said yes we are John Arnott is in the corridor and he would like to see you and I said John Arnott doesn't know us and he said well he he can't come into the meeting tonight but before he goes on to another meeting he wants to meet you and so we went out there and there John was. And um, he says, hi, um, I'm John Arnott and uh, we're Ken and Lois from England. He said, I know uh, you are. And he said, I know you <laughs> are. And, and actually, I was told that you were going to be here. And uh, we said, how's that? He says, well, Benny Hinn called me and said, my good friends, Ken and Lois got from England, are going to be in your meetings can you make sure they're okay, they're welcomed, and can you just look after them? And so actually what John was doing was just doing what Benny had asked him to do. And uh, so we talked a little, and uh, he says, listen, before you go back in there, before I go on to where I'm going, can I pray for you? Yeah. Well, and, uh, ha, ha, shaba. and I remember, I remember saying... Um, Absolutely. And I distinctly remember pushing Lois forward. He did. And I thought, he did. <laughs> try her first. Anyway, um, he put his hand on her head and, she, and my wife went down on the floor. And I, I can only describe she was like an electric eel. Just, just before that, she was like a puppet, you know, like uh, as if uh, a marionette had her on strings like this. And she was jumping up and down. And uh, and then she fell on the floor and she was like an, an, an electric eel and just jerking. And and I'm looking at this and and John wow. actually asked me and said, does Lois um, often do this? Does she actually do this? I said, John, never, never, <laughs> ever. She's my wife. I would know if she ever did that. And she has never done that in all the time that I've known her. Um we would be late 30s at this stage, you know, so we were um, 39, actually. And he prayed for you. And then he prayed for me. Mm. And uh, and I felt the fire of God. I mean, I just felt the fire of God. I felt the fire of God from his hands going from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. And uh, And I fell on the ground and I was just burning, burning. But I had a profound vision while I was on the floor there in the corridor of that, um, the first church of the airport, Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship. And I saw the map of Europe. It was like I had a bird's eye view, way up, more of a satellite view, to tell you the truth, of Europe. And I was conscious of the boundaries and I could see the United Burn. Kingdom and, 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 made, and, and then, and then I'm feeling the map move onto the palm of my hands. And it was on fire. My right hand was on fire. And I, I felt the boundaries of the nations. And every, every national boundary was on fire. Uh, I knew then that actually what God was doing, saying, uh, instilling in me was that one day Europe would be ablaze 
with the fire of God. We had the most incredible week. We came home and, um, you know, we just felt something might just happen extraordinary here. And uh, it was Sunday morning and the whole church were out. Nobody had an excuse not to come that Sunday morning. <laughs> and uh, I had a plan, my plan. It wasn't the Lord's, but I had a plan. And the plan was that the youth leader that we sent would speak for 15 minutes of his experience. Then my wife would speak for 15 minutes. I would speak for 15 minutes. After 45 minutes, we would pray for everybody that was there and release the blessing. That was my intention. Well, our youth leader came up and, um, and he basically said, <laughs> I remember it to this day. He said, if God lives anywhere on planet Earth, I think I've just been to his house. <laughs> It took him about 30 seconds to say that, and then he fell on the ground. So as my wife came up, I said, Lois, you have a little bit longer than 15 minutes. Well, my wife got up there, and she just starts to cry. <laughs> and she's crying in front of everybody. And she says, uh, I just want you to know that I love Jesus with all of my heart, and I love you pointing to the congregation and she fell down well she was only slightly better than our youth leader <laughs> um, she she actually lasted a minute so we're talking about less than two minutes and they were given 30 minutes so i got up and i just thought well i'm just going to have to handle this but you know the moment i stood behind the podium i realized what was affecting them the manifest presence of God was in our church. Yeah. And tangible. Yeah. And so um, I spoke a bit. Dri really? <laughs> dribble. Really. Not coherent at uh, all. And then I thought, oh, I'm just going to give up and we'll, let's get into the prayer and the ministry now. <laughs> and um, I remember you know, having to hold on to the podium, pulling my leg up to counterbalance because I'm going to fall down. <laughs> and out of my mouth come these words, if you want this, then come and get it. And there was a stampede to the front. Every person, I mean, a few maybe at the back, but everybody came for ministry and we prayed till well into the afternoon. And actually, we didn't have a Sunday night, but we came back that Sunday night and the same thing happened. Actually, we were there till after four o'clock in the afternoon. We had to carry people to cars. Um, it was just an extraordinary Amazing. explosion of everything that we'd seen in Toronto, but not even um, being able or capable of sharing with the congregation. So we knew this was truly God and the Holy Spirit because it was spontaneous and it was something that nobody knew would happen. Um, on the Monday night, we were so blown away by God coming to our service that we said, we'll, we'll meet again tomorrow night. We actually didn't publicize it anywhere. We just said, we'll meet again. And I remember us preparing the little um, classroom upstairs for maybe 40, 50 people who might come and very quickly realising that was not going to work because over 100, maybe 200 people turned up on that very first night. By a couple of weeks' time, we were um, hosting a 1,000 people every night, queuing up to come in. Um, sometimes bringing deck chairs, sitting outside for a long time, our conferences of thousands of people, people coming from Australia, from all over the world. Um, but we were living in the glory of God. I mean, I feel very emotional now just thinking about those extraordinary days. Yeah. We were so privileged to host 
something that was so precious. So, you know, the Toronto Blessing is a, is a wonderful global revival, and it's been recognized as a global revival. You know, when we look at revival history, especially over the last 120 years or so, you know, we can look at the uh, Welsh revival and how it was mainly led by 20-somethings. A young girl in a prayer meeting shouted out, wonderful grace, and the Holy Spirit fell. You know, that was one of the series of events where the Holy Spirit fe fell in, in Wales. And Evan Roberts, a young man who was a man of prayer and fire, he just took that and was recognized as the, as the leader. Uh, uh, 100,000 people were saved and added to the church in 11 months during the Welsh Revival. But if you look at maybe what possibly went wrong, maybe there's a couple of things. Uh, some of the older leaders wanted to, quote unquote, put it into order, according to how they thought that church was supposed to be. Uh, the other thing, very practical, is that Evan Roberts seemed to burn himself out. He didn't take care of himself physically. He didn't pace himself in the revival. And uh, actually, near the end of it, he physically collapsed. And then there was a, 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 a lady that took him and separated him from the revival. And she started taking really control over his life. And it seems that her control over him squelched what was going on. And, uh, you know, it just, again, the, also the media at that time, which was mainly newspapers, had serious questions and that criticism that was projected at a, you know, 20 something year old leader or 20 something year old leaders that they really started feeling that personally. And so I think if you put all of those factors together, the physical pacing part of it, the burnout part of it, uh, the intimidation by older leaders part of it, that might, that probably was one of the, uh, those are the factors and why that revival ended. You know, when we look at the Voice of Healing revival, back in the late 40s and the 50s, a massive healing revival came to North America and then over into Europe, but mainly based in North America, where there was a lot of tents set up and uh, mass crusades with incredible, unusual miracles that happened. Uh, and it really garnered a lot of attention uh, in the church. Uh, and it was, there was real genuine miracles that are still documented today. Amazing. You know, why did that end? It, it appears that possibly there was some competition that was going on uh, between the leaders of those tent revivals and those healing revivals. Uh, who has the biggest tent? Who's drawing the biggest crowds? Uh, who's, you know, who's sitting at the right hand, so to speak. And, uh, it's, it looks like, you know, some carnality got in there and some lifestyle issues got into the leadership there. And, you know, after maybe 10 or 15 years, that seemed to diminish. Well, you know, the Toronto Blessing has all the aspects of the Acts chapter 2 revival. In Acts chapter 2, there was wind, there was fire, and there was wine. And uh, that, those were physical manifestations that uh, the church experienced, and it really birthed an evangelistic movement. Um, and throughout church history, not all those manifestations were recognized, even though it, it appears that God was trying to do some of those things, like in the Methodist revival in the 1800s, that there was aspects of those Acts chapter 2 revivals. Uh, but here in Toronto, especially in the 90s and for the first 10 years, there, those manifestations came back full storm with wine, drunkenness, people feeling fire, people being filled with fire. And, and John and Carol just said, this is God and is humbling to, uh, uh, kind of take these manifestations and there's a stigma to every revival. And these outward manifestations became the stigma for uh, the Toronto blessing. And John and Carol and other leaders were just willing to recognize, actually, this is biblical. 
and we're we're willing to to take the the stigma of it, even though there's a backlash from the the traditional church. We're going to go with it because this is in the Bible. It has biblical based. Uh, it has biblical basis. It has a basis in church history, and it's full on now. So we're going to receive it. And so in May of 1994, we moved to uh, Kiev, Ukraine, and uh, we had our four children, and Gwen was pregnant. And we did mainly a lot of evangelism in schools, colleges, universities, on the streets, there in uh, around all of Eastern Europe, actually. And we started planting some churches that became affiliated with us personally. And uh, we kind of started a, 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 a movement there through the churches that we planted. And then one of the things that we loved doing was youth camps. And uh, during one of our youth camps in the summer of 1998, uh, the Holy Spirit fell in a very unique way, similar to how he fell here in the early days of the Toronto Blessing. Joy, encounter, presence, filling, <laughs> manifestations that sometimes had to be explained. And we realized the Lord had visited us. And so that became a, a kind of a, a stewardship for us when the Lord said, I, I want you to start carrying this into Eastern Europe as well as the evangelism. And so in, in May of 1999, uh, we invited John and Carol Arnott to come to Kiev. And we had a great leadership conference with 2,500 people from all over the former Soviet Union come. And again, uh, the visitation of the Lord. And uh, near the end of that conference, uh, I was sitting on the front row there in Kiev, just near the, just at the last day. And I had a vision where the Lord put this baby into my hand, into my hands. And he said to me, Dan, I want you to take care of this baby. And it was really the baby of the Toronto blessing. Oof, I'm feeling the Holy Spirit while I'm talking about this right now. And uh, uh, John invited us to come to the July 1999 first one month school, leadership school that uh, Toronto here was having. And so we, we came over here for that and we got another impartation here during those, that four week school. It was a great school where that impartation happened. And we just took that again back to Eastern Europe. And there we started carrying full time the, the river and encounter. We started doing river conferences and wine schools and Son of Solomon seminars. And uh, that became our full time uh, work at that time. And we, we took our churches and the relationships that we had planted and we, we brought them at that time into Partners in Harvest in the early 2000s. And for us, that's how we got into Partners in Harvest. Partners in Harvest was born out of a need that we mm -hmm. found ourselves in because we were a part of a wonderful church family that now we're no longer a part of it. I think they found us too excessive in our exuberance, too over the top. I mean, the things that were going on in the meetings were um, bewildering, mm -hmm. yet we knew it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we had people roaring like lions. We had people running around the room because their feet were on fire. You know, we just had people popping up out of their seats and they'd go so high that they'd come down and break the chair. <laughs> and, and I could go on and on with yeah. the over the top manifestations, people yelling, woo and whoa, and Carol seeing incredible visions. And yes, mm -hmm. it was just a, a whole dimension of power that we had never touched before. And so I understand how we were beyond their threshold. 
And anyway, we were invited to leave. Mm. So we're now thinking, okay, we'll be an independent church. That'll be fine. It'll fit right in with all the nations coming and all the different denominations coming. And yet we had a number of churches that we had planted. And I, I forget, I think there was maybe seven or eight of them at that mm -hmm. time. And they all said, well, John and Carol, whatever you guys do, we're with you. And so we realized, well, like it or not, we have to form another uh, movement of our own out of this because people were so committed to the, the transforming presence and encounter with the Holy Spirit. They were. They just, mm. we all had so many questions and the need to be together yeah. that, they, that we just said, okay, then we'll have to do this. Right. And we had a church from Tulsa, Oklahoma that wanted to join in. And we're like, well, guys, you know, you're a long way from us. I don't know how we could help you. Then there was another one from England said, well, we're, we want in too. And, and so, okay, then we'll do it. And we, we asked Fred and Sharon Wright if they would oversee that. They'd had many years of pastoral experience and, and leading in a denominational setting. And so they said yes, and Partners in Harvest was birthed out of that. And it was a name that we felt the Lord had given us because we wanted to be partners together in a global mm -hmm. harvest. And so that was the beginning. And Partners remains to this day, but we're bringing them together in this wonderful uh, event we're calling the surge as we surge forward together now as one new movement that we're calling Catch the Fire Partners. Partners in Harvest happened uh, a little bit by an accident. Uh, we as a church, after we were asked to leave the vineyard, we're now trying to figure out who are we? Where do we belong? Which yeah. network do we join? And so we are considering a couple different networks and John was invited to meet with some pastors at one of the airport hotels here. And apparently, I wasn't, wasn't at the meeting, but apparently they said to John, whoever you're going to join, we're going to join. Yeah. And John's saying, well, I'm thinking of this group and that group. And someone said, well, John, why don't you start a whole new network? Well, Partners in Harvest started when um, actually John and Carol were asked in December of 1995 to, to leave the vineyard. And that be, was because some of the controversies and maybe the misunderstandings of, of what was happening here. And it, it was a great disappointment, you know, to, to John and Carol. But there was a group of leaders already around John and Carol who saw them as spiritual fathers and spiritual parents of this revival. And uh, they said to John and Carol, John, we need to, we need to keep on going with this, even though we've, we've had to leave the vineyard. And there is a very key couple that needs to be uh, really honored in this story. And that's Fred and Sharon Wright, who were on staff here in Toronto. And uh, John and Carol realized, you know, we, we need to keep this new revival family together. And, um, you know, John realized that every time there's new wine that is poured out in church history, if a wineskin was not formed to carry that wine, then that wine could easily be lost. And so John, with that revelation, decided to say, yeah, we're going to start a family, a very loose family of churches, relational-based, autonomous churches. And uh, we're going to keep on going with this river that the Lord has given to us. And so I think initially there was maybe 16 or 18 leaders in March of 1996 that gathered around John and Carol. And so this became a global movement out with uh, people coming to Toronto here, recognizing God was doing a new thing and uh, wanting to identify with it and joining this wonderful family which was uh, autonomous churches with the fire values, 
very relational, uh, very present-centered, uh, and uh, recognizing that John and Carol were the founders of that, and we all wanted to recognize John and Carol as the, the spiritual apostolic leaders, as well as father and mother for this, this new move. We were living in Ukraine, and the revival was going strong, and we were just focusing on what God called us to do there, to bring churches and leaders into the revival and to gather them as a fellowship, a group of churches. And God led us to connect them with Partners in Harvest. And during that season, Dan had a number of dreams that God was showing that we were to be closely connected with the Toronto movement. And when Fred and asked Dan and I, when he came to see us in 2005 and asked us about the possibility of becoming the International Directors of Partners in Harvest, we were very shocked. And after the conversation, we actually went into another room and laughed and thought they can't be serious. PIH is a church planting movement, but it's also more of a revival movement. That is, a lot of churches have come in because they love the presence. And the Toronto blessing has brought presence in a way that is unique. Joy, laughter, encounter, sometimes manifestations. And those churches kind of need to feel there's others out there that is okay to have those kind of manifestations or encounters uh, in their church because this happened in other churches as well. So they need a family that feels the uniqueness that they themselves are going through in their local church. Well, over the last 10 years of Partners in Harvest, you know, Gwen and I have done a lot of traveling. Uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to connect with nations. Uh, PIH is in about 40 different nations, especially we love doing river conferences with our churches in our retreats, our conferences. And we love especially going to the poor. And as, as I said, uh, you know, Partners in Harvest is a, is a church planting movement, but we also love going to missions. And so in nations like Turkey, in the Middle East, some nations we can't talk about, other events that we've had into poor nations of Southeast Asia, a lot of uh, outreach into Vietnam. And uh, besides seeing Western churches come into uh, the Toronto Blessing. It's just been a privilege to be part of it. And during my time at university, when I was um, 19, during my summer break, my parents announced to us that they were taking us to Frankfurt, Germany, oh. to the FIRE conference with Reinhard Bonnke. And so we spent five days. Um, we were introduced to Benny Hinn, and it was at the time when he would move his arm and Rose would fall over you know, in his early yeah. days of ministry. And, um, but I remember the significance of that week because Reinhard Bonnke, you know, he was doing stuff that I'd never even seen happen in the church in the UK at the time in the 80s. He was lining people up and he was laying hands on them, mm. giving them an impartation of fire. Word. And I went up there. And I received an impartation of the baptism of fire Come on. when I was 19 years old. And that longing for God was just infectious. When I met you, it was like two years later. And I remember giving you these cassette tapes of this preacher who was an evangelist across Africa. You with your African Nigerian Come background. On. And I was like, I was Duncan. Irresistibly drawn and could not stop listening no. to Reinhard Bonnke. And I just felt this deep uh, fire inside of me mm. as I listened to him to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. Yeah. One night, I got down on my hands and knees, on my face, on my, on my wooden floor at university. And I said, Lord, with all my heart, I mm. ask you, that you would baptize me with a double portion of the anointing that you've given Reinhard Bonnke so that I can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and make him famous like Reinhard Bonnke's made him famous in the nations. And I said, Lord, let if you've heard this prayer, which I know you have, let it be a sign that you will answer it, that one day 
I'll meet him and he will say those very words and lay his hands on me and say, I give you the double portion. You know, when we finished, when we finished Bible college, the Lord opened the door for me to be an evangelist. Mm. And we thought, okay, this is it. We're going to work with this, you know, mm. friend of Reinhard Bonnke's and, you know, in a different ministry, but be that mm. crusade, that mass campaign evangelist. And after our, just my very first trip to Ghana, mm. I'm coming back from a hugely successful preaching to tens of thousands of people, yeah. seeing the most extraordinary miracles, including a paralyzed boy who couldn't walk, uh, walking and then running. Yeah. Uh, I came back thinking, this is it. And then the Lord said, I want you to die to your calling, Duncan, and lay down mm. your uh, calling to be an evangelist. Mm. And I, and I I was so devastated. I didn't even tell you, did I, that the Lord had said that to me yeah. and uh, for a whole month. But then when I shared it with you, mm-hmm. you felt exactly the same. And, and we started a new career mm-hmm. on the farm. And then I remember Ian and Janice Ross also came from Toronto. Come on. And we met them and we saw them minister together as a couple. But really, they introduced us to the concept that God is Father and that we could live in the goodness of knowing God as our Father. The Father's love. I know. Amazing. I mean, we thought it was all about the baptism of the Holy yeah. Spirit and joy. manifestations and joy. And all of a sudden, yeah. we find out that God is our daddy yeah. and that he loves us yeah. and that it's actually all about love. Yeah. Oh, my. It was the most extraordinary, yeah. eye-opening thing, wasn't it, Kate? They called it the event in the tent, and I was invited as a speaker to go to that. Came out, and um, the leader of Salt and Light um, was just seeing us off, and my my wife was in the car. It was starting to rain just then, and um, he had given me my honorarium (laughs) check. Just as I'm about to get in the car, this young man runs out of the tent. I remember him running all arms and legs. And he came and he just ignored the the leader and he came straight to me and he says, have you got time for one more prayer? Mm. Well, I just preached it. So I couldn't deny it, but I want to tell you inside, I was not happy. I was not happy. And so, because I want, my wife was already- You were getting very wet. My mind was, and the rain is starting to come (laughs) down. And so I lay my hands on him and I said, Lord, whatever is on me, put on him now in Jesus' name. And I just prayed a very quick, direct prayer. And this young guy goes down on the floor into a puddle of water. And, uh, well, I have to admit, I, uh, I just left him. I just left him there, got in the car, drove off. And in my rear view mirror, I can see him on the ground. And we just took off. I never saw him again until. I said, oh, excuse me. I'm so sorry. But uh, Ken, do you have one more prayer, please? And I was standing to the side rear of the car. And and uh, he said, okay. And he got out and he came over to me and he just laid hands on me. And I received this impartation And the power of God hit me and I fell down right into a puddle. But I didn't care because we were so hungry for Jesus. Mm. I think it was Toronto. It might have been somewhere else, but it was at a conference. And John came to me and he has with him Duncan Smith. And he's introducing me to Duncan because Duncan had been a police officer like myself. He was from England, like ourselves, so we had these things in common. And he said, um, he's going to be our operational guy, or I just didn't know what title he had, but he was coming on staff. And um, I said, oh, pleased to meet you, Duncan. He says, um, we've, we've met. And I said, uh, really? He said, I said, I can't remember you. He said, uh, remember the event in the tent? And then it all comes back to me. And I'm thinking, this is the guy. And he confirms it. And he says, I'm the young man that ran out of the tent. And uh, you prayed for, and you left me in the rain. (laughs) 
I was struck at that time by his hunger, by his desire. And you know, that's never changed. Duncan remains the same, hungry, fervent, thirsty, desperate. We thought that was it. We'd received so much. We were ready to go back to the UK. But what we didn't realize was John Arner actually wanted to speak to us. Yeah. And it was like the beginning of our destiny being yeah. um, fulfilled at that moment. He asked us for coffee. and Asked us for coffee yeah. and basically offered us, you, a job of all jobs. Tell us your story, he said. And when we'd finished our story... You know, it was it was moving for you and I, mm -hmm. and we were on the verge of tears. Yeah. And at the end of it, um, he said, you know, son, I can really see that you're limping, Duncan. Yeah. And I said, yes, sir, I am. I'm limping. Mm -hmm. And we were very broken, yeah. weren't we, Doc? Mm -hmm. And he said, one of the kindest things that I've ever heard anybody ever say yeah. to me. And he said, well, I only trust a man who walks with a limp. Mm -hmm. Would you like to come and work with me? And it just went so deep into yeah. my heart. Mm -hmm. And I said, you're the kindest, nicest leader I've ever met in my life. Yeah. I'll clean toilets for you for the rest of your life. If I can be on your team and clean toilets, I'm used to cleaning calf stalls anyway, and sheep, sheep stalls, so I'll happily clean the toilets around here. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I think we can do perhaps a little better than that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we, and, and he offered us to work with him. Yeah. And it just changed our lives. It changed it? the course of our future. Three months after arriving in Toronto, John Arnott asked me to be the executive director. And I found myself overseeing uh, 10 departments and 160 staff. And that was an enormous privilege mm -hmm. and totally unexpected for me. I, In fact, when John invited me into his office and asked me to do that. I said, no way, I just can't possibly do that. And anyway, I'm called to be an evangelist and I tried everything to get out of it. But John was adamant that the Lord had spoken to him. And so I said to him, I know I can't do that. And he said, you're right, Duncan, you can't, but we'll do it together. And when he said that with that fatherly love that he has, I knew, okay, I'm 33 years old, but if you're gonna do this with me, John, I can do it. Mm. Yeah. And we worked together for the next eight years, innovating and turning the ministry with the Holy Spirit's leadership, mm -hmm. turning the ministry from being the gathering phase where when we first arrived, thousands of people were still arriving at nightly meetings, mm -hmm. night after night after night, to being a ministry that whose eyes and focus was upon the world. Yeah. And... It was amazing. It was amazing for me. It was a little bit more difficult for yeah. you, wasn't it? Kim? Yeah. Three months after arriving in Toronto, my mum actually died over in the UK. So that was a very mm, tough time for me. Very tough. I was grieving. Mm. I was um, in Toronto raising three young children with no family support, just a you know church support. And I was so grateful for the support I yeah. got from the church in Toronto. Uh, I had been to Ghana, which was my very first trip internationally, uh, about two and a half years after I had arrived. And in June 2002, coming back from Ghana, all excited, I went to be with John. And in John's hotel room in Montreal, he was speaking at a revival. Um, he said, how was your trip to Ghana? And I said, it was fantastic, John. But all the Ghanaian pastors those that had never heard of Toronto and the revival, they said to me, so you're from the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship? Uh, it, is that like a church in the terminal at the airport, the international airport? And, and I suddenly realized, John, that, you know, Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship is a great name for everyone who's heard of the revival because we all knew it as the airport church or the Toronto revival. But in Ghana, it didn't really make a lot of sense. And and he said, well, and we laughed together. And he said, well, what are your thoughts? And I said, well, it had occurred to me that the signature conference, Catch the Fire, that we have every October, now September, um, it would be a phenomenal name 
for our international ministry. And John said, I love it, Dunk. Why don't you start Catch the Fire Ministries on Monday morning when you get back to the office? And that's exactly what we did. And we birthed Catch the Fire Ministries. And just before we left, about two years before we left Toronto to come to Raleigh, the Holy Spirit organized a most dramatic encounter with Reinhard Bonnke. And he was eating lunch at a restaurant. And when John and I heard about it and Carol, we were eating lunch at, in Toronto at the church. And when I said to John, John, Ramesh has just told me that Reinhard Bonnke's in his restaurant <laughs> half a mile down the road. John turned around and he said, come on, Duncan, we're going to go and see him. Mm. And the Lord orchestrated as he came striding across the car park towards us, an amazing meeting and him and Carol hugged and, and uh, greeted each other. And then John turned around and he said, like any father would, mm. Duncan, you can do Reinhard Bonnke's uh, accent. And of course, John's very cheeky like that. And he said, why don't you show Reinhard Bonnke how you can do his German accent? Well, I just about had a heart attack in the moment, but I knew this is no moment to be shy. So I did my Reinhard Bonnke accent. Mm -hmm. And then John said, yeah, and you can do a Nigerian English accent too, Duncan, because you grew up there. Why don't you do that? And I'm like, John, stop. But he loves having fun. And that's what we love so much about him. And I did a Nigerian accent in the name of Jesus. And Reinhard just lost it laughing. And somehow that endeared him to both John and I in that moment in a special way. And John turned, not knowing my secret prayer that I had prayed all those years ago at university, turned to Reinhard Bonnke and said, Reinhard Bonnke, or he said, Reinhard, it would be a great honor for me if you would lay hands on my son, Duncan Smith, my spiritual son, and give him an impartation of the anointing in your life. Yeah. And to my joy, Reinhard said, it would be my pleasure. And he just, I knelt down in front of him and he put his hands on my head and he prayed heaven down over me. And I was completely mushed to the floor. Mm. And that glorious anointing, that double portion, he said, I give you the double portion. And I just crumpled into a heap in that car park. And God filled me with such a love for souls and for the lost. And I was never the same again. And I would, and we became wonderful friends with Reinhard Bonnke. And I'm, I'm so blessed to have phoned him not, not long before he went to be with Jesus. And he he said, Duncan, are you going for it? And I said, Reinhard, we're planting churches and establishing churches all over the world that are winning the lost with that double portion of anointing that you gave us. And that anointing is upon Catch the Fire, Kate. That glorious anointing that is just where God's so hungry for the lost is upon us, is upon John and Carol. It's upon Kate and I, it's upon all of us. Well, God had already spoken to me in April 2004 while I was on a, a trip to Raleigh, North Carolina. And while I stepped, got out of the airport driving along in the car, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to plant a church here one day. Well, there were trees everywhere. I was thinking, what? This is no place to plant a church. Well, of course, it didn't take long to discover that the entire city was inside the forest. And... Uh, and that there were three phenomenal universities and so many hospitals and, and that it was a perfect place to plant a church and had been on God's heart for so long and people had been praying for revival for so long. And I got home in April 2004 and said to Kate, honey, the Lord's spoken to me. We're going to Raleigh, North Carolina to plant the church. That didn't go down well. <laughs> that quickly and we literally just settled in Toronto we just planting churches around Toronto with the GTA with the the young adults and I said to Duncan if the Lord's in this then there'll be a time into this yeah. and sure enough it was four years before 
the vision was fulfilled and we were blessed and sent out from Toronto to go and pioneer and extend the family. And we were going to call our church Catch the Fire. Well, uh, because we were leading Catch we the Fire. We were leading so Catch the Fire. right to do that. And we went with John's blessing and the Holy Spirit showed up. He turned up. Surprisingly, it began to feel like we hadn't left Toronto and we just realized how faithful he is to come when we honor his presence. It was extraordinary. When we do an Ilsom or we do a conference, people encounter God's transforming presence yeah. and, and their lives are transformed. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit began to show us that the, the Father's love and the healing of life's hurts and the power of the Holy Spirit and the fun, yeah. the joy of the kingdom is not really at its greatest expression mm -hmm. until it's in a community where the whole community are receiving the Father's love and then giving that love away. And we realize that the encounter of, of the Father's love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is only... 50% when it's coming to us and us experiencing that, the other 50% is literally when we become the conduits in the Lord's hands of giving that love and that experience away to others. And there's nothing like community that's for that to happen. Absolutely. And of course, that's the church, the body of Christ is the community of believers mm -hmm. that the kingdom of heaven has touched. And and we've discovered, haven't we, Kate, here in Raleigh and planting churches all around the world, yeah. that this revival is never going to end. It is mm -hmm. just an unstoppable force of love. Yeah, and we used to go to uh, meetings that Ken and Lois Scott were holding in their church uh, just down the road because we didn't live too far away from them and uh, just getting blasted in an incredible season uh, of the Holy Spirit moving. Uh, unfortunately for us, because of some issues that we had in our church, it didn't last you know, beyond about three years. But we always felt a real call to plant churches and to, and to lead churches. Uh, I trained as an accountant. Uh, but in, uh, 19, uh, sorry, in 2002, God took us in a, a new adventure. Yeah, we really felt called, as Murray said, to, to church plants. And I'm Australian. Um, and we had a real passion to go out to Australia and just share the love of Jesus out there. And so we, we picked up our three children at that time and moved over to Australia to plant a church with the, net, the network that we were a part of. Uh, and we had an epic fail. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which Falling was actually, forward. yeah, it wasn't yeah. a fail, really. We learned so much um, about ourselves. We learned so much about uh, our Heavenly Daddy. And we kind of were humbled through that experience, yes. weren't That's, we? It's so true. You know, uh, many of us, I, I know I did. I needed a, um, a season where the Lord took me through something of a wilderness uh, to bring humility and dependence upon him. And that certainly, uh, that season was was that for us. Um working long hours, uh, just feeling like I was going nowhere, dying to the calling, uh, really dying to pride, but then the Holy Spirit resurrecting that for us uh, yeah. in such a beautiful way. Yeah, we were just hungry. We yeah. were just hungry and desperate for more because we were, you know, trying to do this church plant and we were just um, desperate to see uh, God break in again in our lives and bring refreshing. And so we would go to Sydney when John and Carol were in town and we uh, went to some of the meetings and they were so kind and loving and just embraced us mm -hmm. yeah, and welcomed us <laughs> in. And, yeah, we had some amazing times where Carol would just put her finger on Murray and he'd just get blasted. And, yeah. and we just, it was just a time of, like, an, those meetings were like an oasis for us yes. to really drink and feed from. During the 90s, uh, Lindley and I had been married and since 1989 and we came to a point in our lives where we wanted to have a family and journeyed into beginning that process. And throughout that time, we discovered that we were both actually infertile. And uh, we went on a journey of uh, fertility treatment and having doctors do what they do. And I remember uh, the day that we got the news that they confirmed for us that we were both 100% uh, infertile. That was the day that John and Carol Arnott were starting 
40 days of meetings in Auckland, New Zealand. And we met over dinner, Lindley and I together. Yeah. And we had just come back from the doctor's office and heard that news. And But we threw ourselves into God at that dinner table and we prayed the prayer, Lord, we know that you are good. We know that you love us. And we know that whatever you have for us is a great plan. So Father, would you please give us plan A? We want your best mm. and we trust you for the best. And we went from that dinner to the first meeting with John and Carol. That was a very pivotal day in our life because God had arranged for us to see John and Carol at a conference for the first time. And it was that day that I realized that there was more that the Lord wanted to give us. And in my heart, I, had, I saw a demonstration of love and power coming together in a package that was so attractive to us. And I remember in my heart saying, uh, watching Carol Anna on the platform actually, and I remember in my heart saying, Lord, I want what she has got. I want to be just like that in the spirit. And it really ignited this journey um, that God took us on that ended we, where we ended up going to live in Toronto to be part of the school of ministry and what God was doing in revival there. Those meetings with John and Carol were so pivotal and such a catalyst that propelled us forward in God towards Toronto. And as we got closer to that time of going to the school of ministry, the Lord really spoke clearly to us. And I had a waking vision of our house with an airplane taking off and a sold sticker on the, ha on the front fence. Lindley had a strong word from the Lord to sell the house. And so we resigned our jobs, sold our house, got on a plane and went to Toronto. You know, it was an amazing step of faith, but there was so much grace on us for that season. And when we got to Toronto, it just opened up a whole new world for us that was amazing. I remember the first day that we arrived and walked into the main auditorium there on Atwell Drive. It mm. was like we walked into a wall of love and we said to each other, I remember the moment we turned and we said to one another, We've come home. It was an amazing moment. It was an amazing moment where we found the, the love of the Father uh, in a whole new way and a sense of belonging. You know, the School of Ministry was an amazing season for us. In fact, our whole nine years in Toronto were an amazing season. We met the Father in incredible ways. I remember having a very powerful encounter with, with the Father. Jesus came and he took me to the Father, just as Scripture says, and I had an amazing revelation that I belong, that I'm his son. And it settled so many issues in my life, so many insecurities and rejection issues just got uh, sorted out right in that moment of revelation that I am uh, belong to him, that I'm his son and that he loves me. The other thing that really impacted us about our time in Toronto was the whole inner healing journey, getting our life uh, hurts healed. Mm. And it certainly healed some issues in our marriage. Uh, and you know, for us personally as individuals, it was amazing time to get our stuff cleaned up and those things in our lives sorted because the Lord knew where he was sending us and the healing journey is so important, especially when we're as leaders, the healing journey is so important to get those things sorted for us to be successful in all that God's prepared for us to do. In 2005, I was emceeing at a Catch the Fire conference and Mahesh Shavda was the guest speaker that day. In the middle of his preach, he came down off the platform and stood in front of me. Oh, I'm getting emotional. And he looked at me and he prophesied that he saw me holding a baby. And that day, that weekend was pivotal in our lives because God did a miracle. And about nine weeks later, we found out that we were pregnant and it just completely rocked our world. God did an extraordinary miracle through a prophetic word and it just propelled us into the miraculous in a whole new way. I, was, I grew up in Japan, actually. My, my parents are missionaries, so I'm a missionary kid. Uh, moved here when I was like, I don't know, one, two. So basically, I spent most of my life in Japan. And from a very early age, I figured, you know what? I don't fit in because, I mean, you know, I look different. And I go to Japanese kindergarten, Japanese school. Everyone looks the same. They all have black hair. 
and you stick out like a sore thumb. And then I go back to the States because my mom's American, uh, my dad's Canadian. And that's technically supposed to be where you fit in. But again, it's a different culture. I didn't grow up in it. So I don't fit in there either. And so no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to be accepted into the culture that I grew up in. And so from a very early age, I always just wanted to, to fit in. What's it like to belong? What is it like to actually be a part of, 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 of a group of people, a culture, a nation? And you go to school and realize, oh, I'm accepted. But that's only because I was the funniest kid in class. You're like, okay, that's weird. And then it's like, okay, I don't want to be like that anymore. So then it's like, oh, the smartest kid in class. Or you become, you know, the you're, you're accepted because you're good looking or you have whatever. And then you get older, join the band, and then it's accepted because you're in a band. So all this stuff goes on. And I go back to the States for high school. And then, boom, I hit Christian religion. And that, again, is like, oh, we only accept you if you dress a certain way or, or hang out with certain people. I'm like, that, that's, not, that's not the Christianity I grew up with. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to find my own path. So you look into the Asian religions because technically that's my peeps, my people. So look into Buddhism, Shintoism, all these different religions. But again, it's all based on what you do. You're only accepted if you do a certain thing. And then one night in desperation, I'm like, wait, God, you know, help me out here. What was this all about? And I realized then and there for the first time, really, that he accepted me just for who I am. I don't have to do anything. I was like, oh, th this, is, this is the God that my parents are trying to, you know, uh, teach the people in Japan and share the gospel with. So I really met the Lord then and there um, at 18. Um, and he spoke very clearly and said, you know, are you going to follow me for the rest of your life? And I was like, okay, yeah, I'm all in. Then anyway, one thing leads to another, and I'm still on this lifelong journey. Like, okay, God, you accept me. I get that, but I want to, I want to run with people. I want to feel a part of a group. And so long story short, um, through Catch the Fire, it's like, I can truly say I found my tribe. You know, it's not because... We all look a certain way or because we all have a certain whatever. It's all based on we're after the same thing. We're after the same goal. And, and it's basically after the presence of the Lord, after, after his goodness, after, after his encounter, his presence. And, and that's, that's the unifying thing. And in, in my long years, and I still have a long way to go yet, but I can truly say that, yeah, you know, this is my tribe. These are my people. And so I'm excited. I'm excited to see what that's going to look like as we go forward um, to run with people who have the same heart, to have the same vision, and, and to see that and try and replicate that in Japan, you know, the, the goodness of God and, and to show that it doesn't matter what you do, who you are, but, but you are accepted and, and, you know, just as who you are. I grew up in England. I uh, grew up in a pastor's house, so I grew up around the church and uh, had a real um, encounter with God when I was about 16, where I was at a Christian camp and, and somebody said, you know, you want to give your life completely, like all in, do you surrender everything? And in the heat of the moment, I said, yes, God, I want to do that. Came down the front, just weeping and just uh, wanted to give everything to Jesus, just completely fell in love with with Jesus. And um, during that time, I saw this uh, kind of vision of a piece of paper coming down from heaven. It was just a blank white piece of paper. And God said to me, will you sign the contract? Will you sign the paper? And I said, there's nothing written on it. What, what, does, what am I signing? And he said, that's the point. Will you sign it? Will you go all in not knowing what's coming, not knowing what's next? And in that moment, that was when I said, yes, God anything, whatever you want, whatever you're going to write on this piece of paper, I say yes to. And um, everything shifted for me then because I had a lot of plans. I had a lot of things that I wanted to do, had career ideas and everything. And at that moment, everything just went. And I just was, yes, God, whatever you want us to do. So when we got together, we knew that God had put Japan on on his heart, but it was also something that God was giving to me as well, that we were both called to Japan together. We knew that's where we were headed. Um, we knew that we were going to work with his parents. 
with the ministry that had already been established here and that they'd been working here. And so um, we ended up coming to Japan a lot earlier than we thought. 1999, we came out to Japan and uh, we've been here for so 21 years um, working here and we've been on a journey. Uh, it's not always easy. It's not always uh, how you think it's going to be. But gradually, the writing on the contract it begins to come clearer and we begin to see the, what God's plan was for us, why he brought us here 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, in the midst of that time, we've be, had the privilege of leading a church. Uh, we've also been able to uh, lead a network of churches in Japan. We've been part of a ministry that's got churches all around Asia and is part of um, really bringing apostolic and prophetic into uh, into many regions. So it's been a really exciting journey, but we're excited to see what it is that God has for us in this next steps. The reality is, is that we had two branches coming out of this Toronto movement, Catch the Fire and PIH. And about five or six years ago, we started conversation with Catch the Fire about the possibility of integrating, merging together. And at that time, it just didn't seem that that was to happen. It just didn't seem the right time. And so we put it aside. And then a year ago, when we got in discussion about it again with John and Carol and Duncan and Kate, it just fe felt like, yes, this was the season. This was the time th for this to happen. And when you look at the two movements, the two groups, Catch a Fire and Partners in a Harvest, and we just realized what was in them, the synergy, putting it together was greater than us staying separate. And with the strengths and the weaknesses that we both have, and with our, our strong leaders that both of us have and our resources, it just felt better to put it together. We could become stronger together. The strengths that PIH brings to this integration is, of course, our fire values, which were the foundation of who we are. Uh, also, they were very relational. We love being a family. We love being that relational community. And uh, we, have, we have wonderful leaders who are pursuing the Holy Spirit and have a heart after both the Word and the Spirit. And so we're a Word movement. We're Bible-based. Uh, and yet we, we love the encounters with the presence of God. And also our churches are autonomous. You know, we're, it's not a denomination. It's autonomous churches where every leader, every team of a local church has the freedom to follow the vision. And yet we're doing it as a family with common DNA. The question is, why do we choose now, this time, to integrate our two movements. And I think the prime reason is that I could see them diverging somewhat. And I felt, no, we'll be stronger as we're more unified. And the urgency that was upon that was a, a sense that I had of global harvest about to come in. So I didn't want us, not, not Carol and I, nor Duncan and Kate, or Steve or Sandra, or any of us, to be fiddling around with the wine skin when we're overwhelmed with new wine. And so, to use another analogy, with the, the wheat harvest is coming in. We don't want to be trying to build the barns when we're overwhelmed with abundant harvest. So we wanted to get the, the thing shaped out now, before we're overwhelmed with a bountiful harvest that is coming. Integration is amazingly good for Partners in Harvest and for Catch the Fire. The, the strengths that both bring, there is a large amount of the Partners in Harvest churches that are joining in. And so all of a sudden, there are cities that Catch the Fire has never been in before. I believe that God is changing us again. I believe that God is working on our hearts, and every time there's change, it's a uh, an opportunity for good disruption to be taking place. Uh, instead of blaming others or saying, I don't like this or I don't like that, uh, we need to always be looking in. And so I think that for Sandra and I, it's been an opportunity to say, mm -hmm. okay, Holy Spirit, the landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. It's clearly God is doing this. Mm -hmm. We agree with the process. 
how do we begin to position ourselves for what God has for us? I think as a leader, I have grown over the years, and so I can always see the bigger picture. So I believe um, that the integration is good because it's going to bring in the harvest that's been prophesied. And if we all come together and work together, um, it is going to, we are going to have a, a, a bigger influence. I think that what God's doing is he's just checking our hearts to make sure, are there, are there, is there one last thing that is inside of you? Is there an offense that is inside of you that um, you need to deal with? Is there, is there um, uh, pain inside of you um, from past situations that you have not dealt with um, that the Lord just wants to deal with? Because what he's going to do is going to be incredible and we are going to have to be ready and we we don't want to be not doing what the Lord has asked us to do because of things that have happened in the past so I believe that's what he's doing with the integration he's bringing us all together as one big family and I I'm believing that we're going to be a happy family when we started Catch the Fire Raleigh, we knew in our hearts that the Lord had given us the blueprints for Catch the Fire World, yeah. a global family of churches. And John and Carol and Steve and Sandra and Kate and I began in 2009 Catch the Fire World. And although we were not Toronto-centric because of the move of the Holy Spirit in Toronto, there's always been this sense of Toronto being the mothership. But as the movement has grown, and certainly through this integration, we've realized being a global family, yeah. we can't be centric around one location yeah. and be centralized. And the Holy Spirit has given us an exciting vision of the spheres, hasn't he, mm -hmm. Kate? Yeah. And we have divided the world into four spheres right now, and we've appointed four couples to begin to mobilize and join together and lead apostolically and pastorally and provide input and vision yeah. so that there's a connection, but there's also a building together. And coupled with that, we have the Leaders Alliance Ministry that will run across all of the spheres where there'll be gatherings for leaders, online connections and um, coaching with Michael Brodeur, Steve and Sandra Long are leading that with Stu and Chloe Glasbro in um, London, who are leading Catch the Fire London. And with that, there's an opportunity for people that are kingdom-minded in business and ministry and church to come together and be equipped and to stay connected and feel part of something bigger, a global family where God is on the move and revival comes to the marketplace yes. and our businesses and our churches. Catch the fires in different spheres. It's so exciting to imagine what, what the Asia sphere is going to bring into the body of Christ and what the, the America sphere and the, and the Europe and, and Oceania, because we all have different things and the freedom to be able to express, you know, uh, express him in, in that and how the Lord's going to just begin to, to free each nation redeem each nation and to see them take their place because i think that's that's so rich if we can see you know uh the koreans the chinese the japanese taiwanese singaporeans malaysians all redeemed and to be able to offer what they have would be an amazing thing and then you have your your european spheres and your and your oceana spheres and all of them just being free to be who god made them to be and to come together and to see the family unite like that to me, that's the most exciting thing. Even to what we're doing here, you feel this support across across the nations. You feel supported. You feel connected. And uh, it just brings a different kind of momentum to what we're doing here. We're so privileged to, to work um, with Duncan and Kate as well and uh, feel the anointing that they carry and the leadership that they carry that uh, we want to see what God is going to do in this region through Catch the Fire. We're really excited. You know, and our passion is is for healthy churches, family together on a mission. Yeah. That we're seeing the kingdom of God advance. You know, I love how in uh, Ephesians uh, 3, 
Paul writes, you know, that, that, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is to be is to be known to all the principalities and powers, and 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 I love the multicolored dimension of the church in all its glorious forms, and and so we're really passionate about that. Yeah, we? and we're excited really for this um, fresh season in Catch the Fire to to uh, move into the sphere. Uh, vision because we really want to see healthy local churches. We really want to um, uh, just have healthy relationships. We we don't want to have like a hierarchy, but actually, uh, or a denomination, but actually a relational network where brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers are, are really operating in in their calling. And we love to have the connection of, of more localized areas where we can support one another and where there's vulnerability and accountability with each other. We, we want to um, just see uh, the Lord do what he wants to do in in the sphere of the Americas and across the world, but we're really excited to to actually for what he's going to do in in this uh, season in this region. As Oceania leaders, we really do believe that God has called us for such a time as this to forge forward in the kingdom, to equip and mobilize an army for the end time harvest. We've always had a passion to connect individuals with their God-given purpose, call and anointing so they can be successful in all that God has created them to be. And now we're just looking at it from a corporate perspective that as a region and as a movement, we are positioned to equip and mobilise the masses for this end time harvest that's about to happen. We really want this part of the world to encounter God's transforming presence. And it's a core belief of ours that as people are connected to their own God-given purpose, they will have encounters with God that they can then lead others into encounters with God. The invitation was given, would, would you come and help us in this new transitional period where we're merging partners in harvest with Catch the Fire? Um, will you help us? And we said, absolutely, we'll help you. And uh, But then the invitation came, would you lead one of the spheres? And uh, that sphere would be Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Would you lead apostolically that sphere for us? Well, it was burnt on your hand all those years ago. Well, how, how could we say <laughs> no when at the very, very beginning of this story, God himself burnt the map of Europe onto the palm of my hand and told me way back there in August 1994 that Europe would be ablaze. Amen. And we accepted the invitation. Yeah. And uh, I suppose, uh, you know, uh, where we see ourselves more apostolic man, mom and dad. And, Grandma uh, and granddad. And Grandma and granddad. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to see emerging leaders coming up and yeah. and uh, emerging um, apostolic leaders um, leading the United Kingdom, leading Germany, leading Europe, leading Eastern Europe and Africa. so on. And then Africa and then the Middle East and wherever God really opens the door. And uh, we just want to oversee and just see this coming up, this groundswell, if you like, of leadership development and people finding their destiny and their calling and being equipped and trained um, in order to do that. Carol and I have been thinking about succession, transition uh, for a long time. And um, part of the reason for that is we wanted to do it well. Yeah. So we realized that you don't just move out and let someone else move in. There needs to be 10 years at least of walking together to where, you know, you, you know each other's heart, the values are, are caught and, and embedded in hearts, right? Wouldn't you say? Yeah, and you, you're walking alongside them, you're 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 mentoring them to some degree you're you're ministering together and it's just it's a relationship yes. it's it's a, a that's son right and a daughter so, and a you know 
We six. were looking for someone, uh, a couple that could be like a Timothy to us. Right. Like Paul had his sons, spiritual sons in the faith. And we, we were having a number of those too. Right. But someone who could really take it on from us, we just didn't feel that we had that person yet. And the Lord had said to me, I have a couple for you uh, from England mm -hmm. that I'll be bringing your way. So I was always kind of on the lookout for that you were, couple, yeah. What, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, you were. And uh, so there was a, a school that we were running here, a church planting school. And I went in to say hi to the school. I think I spoke a session with them there. And there wasn't that many of them. I don't know, 20 or 25 maybe. Like that. Mm -hmm. And um, But I saw this English couple, and uh, that was Duncan and Kate. And so I invited them to come back and talk to me in, in the green room back here once they got clear. Meanwhile, Carol came in and she prayed for them and they're out on the floor <laughs> for the longest while. But anyway, eventually they came and we just chatted and, and I liked them. Mm -hmm. The thing that, that struck me was when I prayed for them, um, I would, you know, went around and prayed for everybody. But the Lord kept bringing me back to that couple. And, you know, I, I hadn't talked to John and I just kept sulking them and sulking them and sulking them for the longest time. Yeah. And then I guess I went back to the green room and then it wasn't long after that that Duncan and Kate came back. So it was it was interesting in the fact that the Holy Spirit had drawn me to them as well. Yeah. Before it, it, you separately, uh -huh. separate and apart from what right. I was feeling. So yeah. we kind of hit it off and uh you know, I'm I'm generous with what we have, mm -hmm. I guess. You and are. I said, "Hey, well, I know it's a big move, but would you guys ever consider moving to Canada? And they, they, they kind of said, oh, would we ever? Yeah. You know, yeah. and I'm like, okay. So they both wanted to go to the School of Ministry, which they did. And it was a month long initially. It's three weeks now, but then it was, it was four weeks. And they loved it. And so uh, Duncan came along on a couple of trips that I did. And I remember we went to Indonesia, and that was a life-changing one. We went to Cuba together, and so we really hit it off. And uh, and so Carol and I were in conversation, and yeah, I like them, and this and that and the other. And so we had uh, a very good relationship that formed over at least a 10-year period. And, right. and and even when they went to Raleigh, um, we we never broke that up. We're we're always on the phone together and talking about things. So we just felt with their gifting and with their leadership abilities, that's the sort of person we would like to hand this ministry over to one day. Twelve years ago, they went and planted their church in Raleigh, North Carol Carolina. And uh, they've done just such an excellent job there. We're so proud of them. And see, the advantage with doing that is they fruit their way in as leaders in their own right. So it's not someone that was handed an easy road and an opportunity. They got in there. They made that work. They prayed it through. And so... God has used them to build a very strong, very successful church in Raleigh. So the foundation is important, but then as you build on that foundation, that is also important. And that's what we're attempting to do here. So we, we kind of have our first stage of Carol and I, but then now that is we're in our late 70s, we want to hand this over and to younger, anointed, uh, visionary leaders that can take it to the whole next level. And we believe that we found those two. That's Duncan and Kate Smith. And so, yeah, we can't wait to anoint them and one day lay hands on them again and say, go for it, you guys. 
we're with you, we're supporting you, we're doing everything we can to see our ceiling become your floor where you can take this to a whole new level. I just want to have a special blessing for Catch the Fire World. Partners and Harvest has everything is mer merging together into one group. I especially want to thank John and Carol for what they have done over the decades and how they've led this great revival and how they've brought the Father's heart and the Father's blessing and wonderful teachings on forgiveness that have impacted my life, have impacted lives of people around the world. Kate and Duncan, we want to cheer you on as you're going to be leading Catch the Fire uh, global churches. We're just so thrilled. I want to commend you in your choice of, of Duncan and Kate Smith. They are wonderful. I've loved working with them, and they represent you so well. And I know that they're going to do a great job of, of leading uh, the movement. I can't think of anyone more highly than Duncan and Kate Smith, a dear friends of mine with tremendous character, moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I pray that you would, in the day of his power, give yourself to God's purposes. God bless you. Uh, Duncan and Kate, I want to commend you guys and, and tell how much I love you and how much I'm impacted by just the fire you carry, the zeal. My goodness, you scare me in all the right ways. All, all the people who scare me the most are the zealous ones like you, and it's zeal with wisdom, and I'm so, so indebted and thankful to you. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that the Lord has raised you up, that uh, the leadership uh, in Toronto and, and abroad has recognized the grace that's on your life. And I just, I for one, am saying, yay, God, this is going to be good. I really appreciate the two of you as leaders and our time interacting, both not only in Raleigh, but internationally as we've done things. And if you've been here in San Diego with us, that uh, you're, the two of you are what I call both and leaders. You not only have a fervency for the presence of the Holy Spirit and a love for the power of God uh, operating to us and through us, high value of that, but you're also people of the Word. And uh, oftentimes I've just been so blessed, Duncan and Kate, by your insistence on, well, what does the Word have to say? And uh, I think of you too. I think of Moses' prayer, Lord, teach me your ways that we might know you. And uh, I just commend the two of you. I'm excited about what you carry and uh, uh, how you're going to lead uh, this group of leaders into the future. Kate and Duncan, I heard the Lord say, prophet and apostle, prophet and apostle. He says to you, oh, team that I created as an apostle and a prophet. He says, now I will list to you scrolls of wisdom and scrolls of revelation. And there's going to be a fresh vision that even comes to you from this day. I know that you're both up to the task that lies ahead of you. I know that God has been preparing you for this. And I believe that just as Elijah received a double portion, just as Joshua led the children of Israel into new territory, just as Jesus said to his disciples, these things and greater will you do. I know that you guys are gonna take the ministry to a completely new level. You're gonna build upon what Pastor John and Carol have spent their lifetime establishing, and you're gonna take it to completely new heights and greater depths for the glory of God. And so from all of us here at Christ for All Nations, to all of you there, Pastor John and Carol, Pastor Duncan and Katie, the whole Catch the Fire world family, I want you to know we love you. We are behind you. We are praying for you. We are cheering you on. And we're believing God for great things for you in Jesus' name. Hey, they're amazing. Man. Yeah. Oh, they're fireball. Duncan is a fireball. I know. He's Preacher. always happy. He's like always very childlike, like, too. Very much. Know? And this Kate is, is such a loving, loving yeah. pastor. Amazing. So we know it's going to be awesome. This new thing you guys are doing global. Uh, going, world going global, yeah. Going global just, and world. The network is growing, and yeah. And with wow. uh, with the fireball, I, like like Duncan is, wow, he's preacher of the cross. <laughs> yeah, right behind me, yeah. preacher of the cross. Ooh. Yay, Duncan! It's gonna be awesome. It's what Duncan brings, the power anointing on him, uh, the anointing for pastoral min ministry on Kate is absolutely. Absolutely fantastic. So congratulations on the succession plan. Congratulations on the merger. Congratulations on uh, this whole new area of ministry that we're all getting into. Catch the Fire is a movement 
that will uh, represent the best of revival and the best of you. God bless you both. It's a great future coming for you. In this moment, we honor you. In this moment, we celebrate you. In this moment, we are so grateful for your history as a movement. But in this moment, as God himself lays hands on you, there is a fresh release that heaven has longed to give to you, that now surges this movement into wrapping its arms again around the world. And I just say in the name of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to you all, the Father for those who love him, which is you, he has more for you than your eyes have seen, your ears have heard, more than you can possibly imagine. And I just blessing uh, to you, even at this teleconference you're all on, that may you all be filled with the Spirit and continue on with fresh prophetic and apostolic vision and anointing in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for this legacy of Kate and Duncan just going even further than we've all been before. We want to anoint Duncan and Kate today do. with oil. And biblically, there were there were three offices that were anointed with oil, uh, the prophet, the priest, and the king. And the prophet Samuel came to anoint uh, David as a new king, and the oil that was poured out over him was symbolizing the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And oil is so unique in that way because it doesn't evaporate quickly like water does. Mm -hmm. The oil has a residual effect of staying on a person for a prolonged period of time. And so let's just look at that story from the book of First Samuel chapter 16. In verse 11, it says this, Samuel said to Jesse, is that all of the young men? In other words, no more sons? Something wrong here. Jesse replied, there is still the youngest one, but he's taking care of the flock. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we cannot turn our attention to other things until he comes here. So Jesse had him brought in. Now he was ruddy with attractive eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, Go and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn full of olive oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day onward. Then Samuel got up and went to Ramah. Now that's a wonderful biblical account of the anointing uh, of olive oil that was used to symbolize this person of the Holy Spirit, Carol. Yes. And so we want to anoint Duncan and Kate Smith to take on the leadership of this wonderful movement called do. Uh, Catch the Fire Partners. And we just believe as that oil comes yeah. upon them that there will be an impartation mm. of the Holy Spirit yes. of God that would rest on them from this day forward to do that which you have asked them to do. And so, Father, we consecrate this oil we right do, here mm. to be active, you, pregnant symbols mm. of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. And that the anointing will come upon them rich yes. as we pass on mm -hmm. this ministry uh, and the leadership of this wonderful ministry to Duncan and Kate Smith. And so in Jesus' name, in Jesus we name, anoint you, Duncan. We do, Duncan. We anoint uh -huh. you to be filled with all that the Father has for you. Wow. And we bless you, Duncan. We do bless you, Duncan. Holy Spirit, come upon him. Fill, fill him, fill him, fill him, fill yeah. him. And as it was with David, let the Spirit of the Lord come upon you and yes, remain Lord. upon you through 
be thick and thin and the battles of life and the ups and downs and all the complications and all the good, the bad and the ugly. Be with them, Lord, in every way from this moment on. Yes, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, that for wisdom. I thank you, Lord, for an anointing as we've anointed Duncan with oil. Lord, that incredible wisdom would come upon him. Lord, to lead this movement. Oh, Father, I thank you. I thank you so much for him. Lord, he has a heart that runs after you. And we bless your heart, Duncan, to be anointed with God, be anointed by the Holy Spirit, to run to God with everything that you need. He's a Father that will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Yes, and Kate, we anoint we do, you. Kate, we anoint pour you. this oil of gladness and joy, yes. and anointing richly upon oh, you. Thank you in for Jesus her, Lord. Jesus' mighty name. Oh. And we bless you to thank be you, all Lord. that you are created to be. Yes. Father, let the oh. goodness of heaven come upon Kate. Flood right her, now. Lord. Fill her with the heart of her Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord. Fill her with the heart of her Savior for yes, Jesus. people who need to be loved to life. Mm -hmm. We bless you, Kate, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let well, it change thank you, in, Lord. in Jesus' name. And Father, I just pray, Lord, over Kate, and I bless you, Kate, oh, with all the giftings of God, everyone that you need to run the race alongside your husband. Lord, I ask that, that you would just unite them in even a stronger way. Ah, that, Lord, they will be such a team that hears from you, that has your heart, that loves people. God, we just bless them as they take on this uh, role of mm, leadership. In Jesus' name, let the anointing make room for you both. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Duncan and Kate, I just want you to realize that all of us are behind you in this in this wonderful yes. venture. Uh, and we bless you in the name of the Lord to to be like the priest of the of the movement hear God intercede for the people mm -hmm. and bring us all before the Lord as a priest would do but also hear the word of the Lord as a prophet would do and then make wise decisions as a king would do and let the anointing be the thing that leads you and guides you may you hear the voice of the Lord behind you yes. saying this is the way walk ye in it when you're about to turn to the right or the left. Thank you, Lord. Father. Thank you, Lord. Oh, bless them. Bless them. Oh, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Personal encounter and transformation becomes community encounter and transformation as the Holy Spirit doesn't just touch an individual, but he begins to touch an entire community and the Holy Spirit in you for you, as Bill Johnson would say, and on you for others goes to another level of the Holy Spirit among you for an entire city, entire nations to be transformed in the most extraordinary outpouring of the Holy Spirit's power but it goes deep into the transformation of a city when communities begin to be transformed and people's identities are secured in the Father's love. Then a whole city can begin to have a hope that it has a future of total transformation. And this is what the Lord has begun to show us here in Raleigh and in the nations around the world through our churches that the Lord's looking for 
that future, what's reserved for a future day of the new Jerusalem where heaven and earth have become one. And we know that that is reserved for that time after judgment day. But for now, there's something about reaching by faith into what's reserved for a future day, as Bill Johnson taught us many years ago, that allows us by faith to access what's reserved for tomorrow and bring it into today. And Kate, my heart is longing that we by faith as communities full of the fiery love of God would be able to start to reach by faith for that new Raleigh, that new Toronto, that new Sydney, that new London, that new whatever your city is, that is reserved for that day when one day it will be fully transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So as our communities are transformed and our cities become transformed, our cities begin to start to be invaded by the kingdom culture of love and power. And families are transformed. And and businesses are transformed, economies transformed, poverty is eradicated, sickness is eradicated, um, injustices are eradicated, and the community begins to look and feel just like what it's always meant to be, heaven on earth. And that is our destiny as Catch the Fire World. Cities on fire, cities that look like heaven on earth all over the world. We know that as you've been listening to us and others speaking, your hunger, like our hunger, has been growing and growing. And hunger is a gift from God. And we want to give you an impartation, not just of hunger, but we want to give you an impartation of the very presence and the very power and most of all, the very love of God to come upon you right where you are as you're watching this moment. We know that the Holy Spirit is going to fill you and baptize you and anoint you with that liquid golden honey love of the Father. And you too are going to burn with passion for Jesus and a desire to see your families transformed and see your communities and churches transformed and your cities and nations transformed. Mm. Okay. And where you are right now, you know, stand up or hold out your hands in an expression of your heart response to God because he wants to come now with his fire and with the Holy Spirit. He wants to baptize you right now in your living rooms, with your families, in your car, wherever you are. Let him come right now. And we release. Yes. We release to you a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit that you would receive freshness, fresh oil, so that you could have an encounter with the living God today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you that you would baptize every person watching in this moment. You would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and fire. Lord, we ask you that what you've given us from John and Carol, from Heidi Baker and Bill Johnson and Reinhard Bonnke and many others in this glorious revival that we've experienced, Lord, that Kate and I have been blessed to receive in those impartations. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we release that impartation onto everybody, wherever they are. Lord, baptize them with fire in Jesus' name. Take it, take it. Receive that anointing, wow, that yes. glory. Just let him come to you now. You, Some of you are beginning to feel him right now, as Duncan was sharing earlier, that you're feeling electricity in yes. your fingers. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Some of you, of you are feeling hot. Some of you are just feeling the peace of God. And some of you are just feeling like you're on fire. Yes. That is the evidence of the Holy Spirit yes. baptizing you today. Come Holy Spirit. More, Lord. Yes, increasing, more, Lord. Keep more, coming. More, keep coming. To all those hungry and thirsty ones, Lord, right now. Yes, thank oh, you, Father. Yes, Lord, all over the nations. Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would fan into flames the revival that has been going on now for over 25 years. Lord, I ask that you would fan it into flames in a greater measure than we've ever experienced, Lord, that it would burn all over the world, your fiery love 
would go all over the nations of the world. An uncontainable contagion of God going all over the world, reaching the lost. Lord, let that billion soul harvest that Bob Jones prophesied, Lord, all those years ago. Lord, we ask you in the name of Jesus that your fire, Lord, would go to the nations yes. and that you'd reach the lost. And Lord, yes, and I ask that you would reach our family members, that there would be dreams and, and revelations and, yes. and Jesus appearing to family members, that you would just meet them, Lord, wherever they're at. Yep. Father, that you would give us boldness to speak your word, to talk about Jesus with our neighbors and our friends. Yes. Just a holy boldness and courage, just Ooh. to fall, Lord, that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we ask you for a great anointing for supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. Lord, those greater works that you promised Jesus in John 14, 12, that if we believe in you, not only will we do the things that you do, but even greater works would we do in your name because you go to the Father. Lord, we're asking for every person watching, for every church, Lord, that you would just upgrade us all with the greater works. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, just receive his presence right now.